This is Jim and I'm Josh. We're from Stone Sour. You're and this... <laughs> this is why we didn't go into television. Yeah. Hey everybody, Jim Root. And Josh Rand from, from Stone Sour. <laughs> Sour. <laughs> this is fret12.com. No one's laughing now. No one's laughing now I'm so innocent and you can't put a price on me I'm using uh, the Hughes and Kettner Triumph, the MK2. I've been using it since about, since 2005 and uh, it's been awesome. I love it. The Rivera uh, Silent uh, ISO cabinet and uh, just got that, That's that's new. Uh, and it's got a vintage Celestion 30 in it. And then um, here's my heads. Uh, right now they're loose because um, we're doing an A and a B rack. And uh, Hughes and Kettner Triumph, been with Hughes since 2005. Um, they, they're awesome. They're like bulletproof for me, knock on wood. Um, we use the uh, MIDI exchange to switch, so both heads switch. Uh, clean and dirty. Um, then I have a little fly rack with my uh, Audio Technica wireless unit in it and the selector for it. I'm using orange rocker verbs and have been since like shit for a while. <laughs> the reason I had two was because um, I was running cabinets on stage and then we were running an ISO cab with the other one but now we don't run cabinets on stage so I only run one head and this is my ISO cab that we actually built um, out of a couple of just 412 road cases that we had um, but there's an orange 412 in there with vintage 30s in it uh, mic'd by a 4050, uh, two 4050s and then um, basically just running straight into the head. Um, I use the head distortion for, you know, just the preamp game for my distorted channel. And the clean channel is pretty dry. I usually build the pedal board for whatever our set is, and as you can see, uh, you know, just the tuner that I use sometimes as a bypass, you know, the line drive by uh, MXR, a lot of MXR stuff. Um, the one interesting piece actually is the Kirk Hammett wall, which uh, Dunlop actually customized for me, it's switchless, and they made three of them and I have two of them. I'd have to say it's probably the, the old Boss NS2s for me because I mean any any pedals you can kind of switch out for different pedal for different things like for color or for whatever you know and I've got a an arsenal of different pedals like that but I mean an essential pedal for me is the pre lead free solder NS2s and I've only got like three of them left but uh, they they seem to work the best as far as like noise suppression for me and I know it's kind of a not a cool pedal or whatever but uh, it's pretty essential. For, for me anyways. Uh, you normally run a little bit of compression on the clean channel, a little bit of delay, um, NS2 noise suppressor just to keep everything from humming too much. Uh, the POG is great and I also have a pedal board out front that has this uh, switcher on it. Oh, there it is. <laughs> I run this out front so I can, you know, I've got a, a carbon copy on it that I can actually control, you know, with my foot or with my hand. Um, I run this true bypass uh, with a wall plate, so if you touch that anywhere, I'm going to turn the wall on. And I use one of the original Jimmy Hendrix, well, it's like a reissue Jimmy Hendrix wall pedal. Um, I got a pog out here that I can control separately from the pog that's in the GCX. 
and then, um, you know, just the GTX switcher. Um, you know what, I've been trying to get those dialed in, like working pretty hard at it for the last year, and my last prototype that I got, I, I said it's cool, let's go for it, so now it's kind of out of my hands and it's, it's up to Fender to see how, how quick they can get them into production, and since we're doing a compound fretboard radius on it. This is um, prototype number three, I think, of the Jazz Masters they sent me, and it's got the kind of the matte candy apple red top with the black on the back. I wanted to kind of do like a throwback, like kind of a, an homage to the original Fender colors, you know? Right. So it'd be cool to do like a Shoreline Gold and Inca Silver and all that stuff too. But um, it should have brushed aluminum pickups in it. Right now it's just got uh, the regular EMGs. There's two 81s in it now, but normally I have an 80, an 81 and a 60 in the neck. One volume, three-way switch. This has a compound radius fretboard. Um, starts off about 12, ends up at about 16 and three quarters. Jumbo frets, um, ebony fretboard, maple fret or maple neck. No serial number, no signature yet. <laughs> Prototype. Um, you know, I have them shave the heel so you can get in there. But the Jazz Masters are, you know, they're really well balanced live, and you can get right up to that high fret, really without much ado, anyways. So. I think they have the tooling set up to do that since my strats are already that way. Um, so it should be relatively quick. I was hoping to kind of have it ready for this winter NAM, but uh, that didn't really work out and we're on tour anyways, so I couldn't have been there to, to do a release of it. But uh, hopefully within the next six months there will be some talk about it. Official in time, if you don't have a weapon, you can't have I've got backup to that is a, a different prototype just a matte black there's the brushed aluminum ones 81 and a 60 same thing um, this one it? this is the first prototype though so this only has a 12 degree fretboard radius on it um, a little bit different I was kind of experimenting with something different to do you know kind of like a combination between the uh, tellies and the strat you know what gain strings um, ah yes this is a uh, C sharp tuning and I use an 11 15 20 plane 36, 42, 56. So relatively light gauge of strings for as low as we tune. You know, a lot of dudes are using like 13 through 60 or whatever. And, right. You know, I still like it to kind of feel pretty slinky, you know. So I use a little bit lighter of a gauge. And then um, here's one of my original prototype tellies. The, if you ever see me playing a white one or a black one, they're the first two that I ever got. I don't know, this is pretty dirty. But uh, this is like... These are like my favorite guitars still, you know. These are the original original prototypes that I got sent however many years ago, I don't even remember, but they're they're starting to wear in real nice, you know. Yeah. I mean you do a year or two ring on a guitar like this, it's like four or five years, you know, it gets everything gets worn down nice and neat. Yeah. And they're all it's crazy too, because they're all like the white this white one and black one, they're wearing in exactly the same spots everywhere, you know. Like the clip lock straps, I'll do that same thing to the back of them, and you know, I think this is from Martin. He likes to, he likes to stick the guitars here to tune them, you know. So. Uh, <laughs> watching the stuff. Yeah. Now, but they, is yeah, there ever going to be a, a trim version, like with the jazz man? Um, they, I probably not. Maybe a Floyd. They, I do have one that's a, that's got a Floyd in it, mm -hmm. but um, I, I don't really use it. I don't really use the tremolo that often. I'm just gonna leave everything hanging. I'll let you put everything back. And then I have. Um, we were experimenting with colors at Nam last year, so I had them make me a Strat in this kind of. Uh, it looks like a brushed aluminum with a patinaed copper uh, pit guard. So it's just one of my regular signature Strats, same specs. Yeah. All that stuff, you know, um, just a different color, and it's actually pretty cool. You know, I, I like it a lot. It's different, you know, because normally I just do white or black or whatever. But this, uh, this could be something that maybe we could see as a limited run in the future. You know, Great. painted headstock too, which I normally don't do. But uh, you know, it might be cool to kind of switch things up for a while. And then uh, with Stone Sour, we're doing um, we're doing some E flat tunings. And uh, so I got a couple of E flat guitars out with me, and basically, um, this is just a regular off the shelf black top jazz master that you can get at like Guitar Center or wherever. And I really I like the way they play a lot, and I like the fact that 
it had a cutout for a humbucker and it still has the Jazzmaster single coil. So um, I, was, I got with Martin, my guitar tech, and I was like, man, I really love the sound of that, that single coil up front, but I want a little bit more saturation, a little bit more output, you know? So we went ahead and put an 81 and left this pickup here. So there's two volume knobs and then just basically a two-way switcher, essentially. So you either have this pickup or this pickup, and then you can control the, each volume separately in order to have passive and active coexisting in one guitar, you know? Um, but it works out great for, uh, you know, we do like Through Glass, Traveler's Part 2, um, you know, songs like that, the E-flat tunes. And then I've got um, Alex over at, Fent me, at Fender built me a couple of necks. So this is um, before we ever had my signature models, Alex built me uh, three necks and put them in strap bodies. And I had um, this happens to be the three single coil version. I think it's a David Gilmore set of single coils that's in here. Um, so this is basically what my uh, my Telecaster necks are based off over of, these old Strat necks. But uh, these things sound so great for you know some of the cleaner stuff and some of the less saturated gain stuff. And for the hell of it, I just I threw a kill switch in in this one. You know, just, eh, 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 do that Gibson trick. You know and five-way selector, but other than that, it's just pretty standard, you know, no tremolo, so Inca that Silver. So volume tone or is it volume volume? This is uh, volume tone, Okay. yeah, which that never gets used, so, you know. Basically, just for the recording session for audio secrecy, um, I tried PRS, and then when we started touring for that album cycle, uh, the PRS's just didn't feel comfortable. I had always been an Ibanez guy from when I started playing, and so I, I ended up switching back to Ibanez. And uh, currently I'm using the custom shop uh, essays that are built for me, and now we're getting ready to arrive. They're gonna send me a bunch of new uh, custom shop S's. Um, the first one is a custom shop SA. This is the uh, Mia guitar. Uh, which is my daughter, my youngest daughter, and she picked out the finish for it, so it's kind of like her guitar. Then we have my other daughter's, which is, uh, we call this the Zoe guitar, the nice top on it, uh, with the FX bridge on both of them, with the EMGs, 81s. Yeah, and the EMG loaded everything is with an 81 in the bridge. Some of them have 60s in the neck, some of them have uh, 85, depending on the guitar. This is the limited run Japanese RG that they did, um, I think in like 2005, 2006. Jim actually uh, bought this guitar for me for uh, a birthday gift because uh, he knew how bad I wanted one and they sold out really quick and he was able to find one. And I sent it back to Ibanez to have them put in uh, the EMGs in it. Next we have the metal plated guitar, which is interesting. It's got the chrome EMGs in it, RG. Uh, it's actually aluminum that I plated myself and all the rivets, it's actually really riveted in. There's like a hundred and I think 32 rivets in it. it. Took me like 16 hours to do the finish on this. Yeah, it's brought, I mean, it's full on. Is that guitar pretty heavy? No, it's actually pretty light. So, believe it or not, the aluminum weighs nothing. It's all aluminum, oh, so. Okay. Um, yeah, I basically did a, traced out the body cut the whole body out and uh, you know broke it and notched it and did all the cutting and then put it all back together and pre-drilled all the rivets because it's actually as I said it's really riveted in the album cover for House of Golden Bones that's sick yeah wow. uh, uh, one of my closest friends owns a sign company Chestnut Signs in Des Moines Iowa and so actually what this is is a wrap um, okay and uh, so to just test it, it was more of us just testing it out. He wanted to see if he could do it, which was pretty awesome. And uh, 
yeah, it came out amazing, and he just, I'm a huge Atlanta Falcons fan, and he actually did uh, an Atlanta Falcons guitar, but I, it's at home. So, yeah, it's, and he did it, like, in, like, 20 minutes they did it. It was insane. I use uh, the Dunlop Sharps uh, and also uh, the Tortex 73s for stuff that I strum on, like through glass. Um, strings I use uh, uh, Everly 56 through 11 for all the drop tuning stuff, the super low stuff, and then uh, just the standard set of uh, 46 through 11 for the E flat guitars. Uh, the tunings that we use are the C sharp, which is a step and a half down, and then a drop off of that, so a step and a half down to the C sharp, and then dropping the low string to B, and then we do uh, E flat, which is everything a half step down. And I'm using the Tortex, uh, they're the Tortex 3s. It's basically like a cross between a Tortex and a Jazz 3. But I'm using 1.5 mil, and I was using like um, the 88s for some of the strummier stuff. But I just I just use the 1.5s for everything now. Um, string gauges on drop B and C sharp. I use 11, 15, 20 plane, 36, 42, 56, and uh, you know pretty slinky. And then for my E flat stuff. Um, I was using 10 through 46s, now I'm just using 9 through 42s, I think. Um, I kind of, you know, I get weird and I change things up a lot, so um, the only thing I haven't really changed are the drop and the lower tuning gauges. I've been using those pretty consistently for, you know, the past six or seven years. Um, what else are we talking about? Pick gauges or string Pick gauges? Kind of strings you use. Oh yeah, I'm using Dunlop strings. <laughs> Plug. <laughs> The cool thing about the Dunlop strings is they they can make the same gauge string, but they can they can change the core of the string. And one of the things that we we started experimenting with a little while ago was making um, making the string actually you can change the tension of the string by the core of it. And they have they wind their own strings, so um, we kind of played around with that a little bit. The problem I had with settling on one way is the nature of each individual guitar. Some guitars just feel slinkier than other guitars. Um, like uh, if you see the video, the Silver Strat that I pulled out that had the three single coils in it, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter how thin the strings are on that guitar, it feels really tight and, and stiff. You know, it's got a lot of tension on it. But I could take the same exact ga gauge of strings and put them on the Blackmaster Tele or uh, Jazzmaster, Blacktop Jazzmaster, and um, it feels really slinky so you know I kind of found a happy medium to where it was slinky enough that I felt comfortable with bending whether I'm sitting down playing or whether we're playing live because I tend to dig in a little bit harder when we're playing live um, without it like you know going to grab a half step bend and all of a sudden you're doing three steps you know what I mean so uh, so yeah Dunlop I mean, we just lend amplifiers, you know. Uh, the studio rig for me um, was the Hughes and Kettner, um, Saldano SLO 100, and a modded, actually that was it. Yeah. Corey ended up using my modded Ampeg. So that was it for me. It was just the, but it, it's more of just capturing the blend, the guitars. Um, you know, for solo wise, I always use. I have a Paul Gilbert uh, model that I use because I like the pass. I love active for the rhythm guitars. I like the passive pickups for for solo tone, and then just a bunch of different stuff. I mean, I guess the main thing is is having the eighty ones EMGs in the bridge position is probably um, an important asset. Of for doing a record or for release rhythm guitars. Yeah, my rig was basically 
my oranges. Um, you know, I blended, uh, it seems like the last couple of records I've done, um, it's been a blend between a Diesel Herbert and the oranges, you know, because the, the oranges have all the mid-range and that barky kind of, you know, uh, classic British kind of style bite to them. And the Herberts just kind of have more of a modern voicing, you know, so you can get all that low end and super gain and all that stuff. But um, that, that's basically it. And as far as, as guitars are concerned, we'd have to like look at Mike's liner notes for all the guitars that we had in the studio because like, uh, like off the top of my head I know my white prototype Tele um, that I haven't been bringing on the road with me that's like that's like the main guitar that um, all the producers like and that we I, I was using that end up using that for like the main rhythm tracks on my side um, but I mean I have like 130 guitars and I try to bring as many of them to a studio as we can and we end up using, or I end up using a few different ones and probably used 10 or 15 guitars on this on this last record and I couldn't even tell you which ones they were. So if we can track down Mike and go through his liner notes because they were documenting everything that we did. Actually, that's something we should do. I should see if I can email him and get a list of the liner notes from that record. and and see exactly what guitar are used in each song and each layering part and stuff like that. I'd like to know that myself. Right. Since I suffer from CRS, you know, can't remember shit. There you yeah. go. <laughs> I'm in time. If you don't have a weapon, you can Rhythm-wise, we record together. We've been doing that since uh, come whatever May. It was Nick's suggestion of us, instead of trying one of us cutting the rhythm track and the other having to match that rhythm track of trying to capture a vibe and not necessarily be perfect to a grid and it more, having just be more organic and natural. So that's how we, we've done, you know, the rhythm guitars and for, as I said, the last four records. Yeah, it uh, works out good that way because then you're not like, because we have different styles and if I lay the tracks down on a song first then he's got a match to me and if he lays down a song first then I got a match to him and then it's you know you're not really getting the vibe of both of our playing but when we sit down next to each other and play it it's like seeing us live you know and and then that way it makes us kind of work out parts a little bit better like is that are we hitting that three or two right. or is it a whole note there or a half note or what's the picking pattern on that you know and we stuff, can dial that stuff might change it. too yep. you know it happened a couple times with house of Golden bones you know recording that where, where riffs kind of changed uh, you know in the moment of just doing this different note or this or that you know and then you know then comes the layering and then the solos are at the very end right. Mostly a collaboration, but we all write individually. Um, it's hard for this band because Corey and I are always, you know, we're, we do Slipknot as well, so we're we're gone there. So Josh will, you know, he, he's got his home studio, so he'll be writing stuff at his home studio. And then I'll be writing stuff on the road, Corey will be writing stuff on the road, Roy will be writing stuff on at, at home, or if he's out working with another band. And then what we do is we kind of we put the demo pot together, <laughs> you know what I mean, where we we kind of start sending each other all of our stuff that we've done and then depending on what Corey writes to, that ends up kind of essentially being the framework of the record, you know, and then, um, and then we kind of get together when we can find time, like Josh will come down to Florida or if I'm up in Iowa, we'll get together and just kind of start hashing through stuff and then we'll send stuff to Roy and... His demos always sound better than all of our demos because he's got like all this crazy setup in his garage. So. Well, you know, my you know, when I do my demos. It's easy <laughs> drummers. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I stopped. I stopped even using Easy Drummer now. I just do it to a click because I found that if I if I put drums with Easy Drummer on there, then Roy would tend to play what I put there. Yeah. So I was like, you know what? Screw that. I'm not going to put any of that stuff there. And he's like, well, because it's in my head. I heard it that way. You know what yeah. I mean? So. <laughs> So if I don't put any any drum beat at all and just do a click track, then um, you know songs like Digital can happen where Roy's free to kind of explore the room, you know. It's Italy for me. I mean, for me, it's the seafood in Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's good too. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, playing guitar in a bar, cleaning the toilets after we're done. <laughs> um, probably a car salesman. 
Bar owner, bar cleaner. <laughs> no one's laughing now. No one's laughing now.